You're listening to episode 15 of Storycast 21. I'm Jane Secker. The UK has a long history of exploration. However, by 2016, only one astronaut, Helen Sharman, had travelled space bearing the colours of the UK flag. No Briton had ever experienced the most demanding and perilous experience of spaceflight until one January morning in 2016. This is Tim Peake, Britain's first spacewalk. My name is Tim Peake, and I'm an astronaut with the European Space Agency. I had a six month mission to the space station on the 15th of December in 2015. By the time you take the elevator ride up to the top of the rocket, you're completely focused on the mission ahead of you. Major Tim is ex-Army Air Corps and a former helicopter test pilot with more than 3,000 flying hours. But it's taken another six There's huge amounts of excitement and anticipation. You know things might go wrong. And you're just hoping, really, that, you know, today is, is going to be OK. A day of carefully timed choreography began with Tim leaving the hotel where he's been quarantined so he doesn't get sick. I'm Thomas Moore, I'm the science correspondent. I was there with Tim Peake in Baikonur Cosmodrome, Kazakhstan. And it was great to see, uh, you know, the Union flag patched on Tim's arms as he got into the capsule, sat there grinning, giving the thumbs up. Really, it's a, it's a case of just being overwhelmingly excited about what is about to happen. We were there with Rebecca and Tim's boys. A second service tower separation. And we could see it, the excitement on their face, but also the concern. I and mean, you have to remember that there are no guarantees in space. away standing with a team from Sky. Not only was the flame blindingly bright, but the noise was so loud that it reverberated in our chest. After six years of training, Tim Peake finally ripped through the Kazakhstan skies. Just 45 seconds after launch, his Soyuz rocket was nearly seven miles high and travelling at more than 1,000 miles an hour. So obviously your acceleration builds and builds and builds up to about four Gs. And that's when you're really pushed into the back of the seat. Stage one separation confirmed. You've got to get up to 25 times the speed of sound. Rebecca and the boys are spellbound. We're about, um, you know, 150 kilometers up in space and the rocket is almost horizontal because you haven't got that much more altitude to gain. And nine minutes into the flight, the last rocket engine cuts out and Tim feels weightlessness for the first time. A Brit is back in space. You know, you feel like a complete novice when you first get into that environment. You're not quite sure what's going on. It's, it's actually hard to control your body because um, your legs and arms are floating all over the place. The Soyuz is in orbit at an altitude of 140 miles. Mission Control must now do its sums to catch up with the ISS, orbiting 250 miles above the Earth. A first engine burn moves the Soyuz from its insertion orbit up into a... I had a six-month mission to the space station. The science programme never stops. It's going 24-7, 365 days a year. And as a crew member, your job is to pick up those experiments. The process is repeated to move it into the same orbit as the ISS. A side thruster then changes... I've always been fascinated in pushing the boundaries. And when I launched the space, I, I desperately wanted to do a spacewalk. And I knew that there was a chance of doing a spacewalk, but you're never guaranteed one. So we just see if we can pick up where they're at in the operation. So to give you an idea of what you're looking at, um, the front of the space station, where it's kind of flying forward around the Earth, that's the Columbus module, the Japanese module, um, very uh, shiny, reflecting lots of light. 
then you move your way back to the main truss and that's like this sort of corrugated metal structure where the solar panels are mounted that's the length of a football pitch and then as you move further back down the space station you're looking towards the russian segments which are smaller diameter and painted white so the space station kind of changes color as you move down copy standing by for contact contact has been confirmed and the visiting vehicle officer here in houston confirming contact and capture has occurred so tim coper yuri Milenchenko, co and uh, Timothy Peak now uh, docked to the International Space Station at uh, coming at. So Tim was with two other astronauts. There was a, a NASA astronaut called Tim Kopra, and the Russian commander was Yuri Melanchenko. He had been to space many times, whereas Tim Peak, this was his first mission. Well, the station was flying 252 statute miles uh, over the country of India. So again. When you arrive on the space station, uh, you get you know you get a huge sense of satisfaction from being able to just push off with one finger, float down the space station, and end up exactly where you want to go. And it can only be totally weird to sleep while floating in a sleeping bag, while down below you you see the Earth spinning gently below you. Well, there we can see Tim Peak on the big sky news wall. Station, this is Sky News London. How do you hear me? Yeah, I think what's happening now is he's talking to NASA, he's talking to hello, all Sky different News sound in London, people. And uh, hello to uh, everybody at the National Space Centre, Leicester. I hear you loud and clear. Fantastic, Tim. It's great to join you. Thank you so much for joining us. I've always been fascinated in exploring what we can do better. And everything you touch is just cutting edge technology. But not only was Tim Peake the first Briton to travel to the International Space Station, he had this dream of walking in space, a perilous undertaking, of course, uh, and the pinnacle of space flight, floating tethered to a space station while it orbits the Earth at 17,000 miles an hour. I was quite fortunate that something broke on the space station, one of the solar panels. So we had to go out and replace that component in order for that part of the solar panel to work again. For me, it was the view of Earth that motivated me. OK, guys, uh, let us talk for just a second. Everything looks good. Just hang out for a second and we'll give you final words. We still got 17 minutes from working eclipse. My spacewalk was on the 15th of January in 2016. Uh, we actually spent the whole morning uh, preparing for our spacewalk. We get into our suits quite early. We go into the airlock. This work uh, by Cobra and Peak uh, is required to properly seat uh, the replacement sequential shunt unit. And You're obviously concerned that everything goes as smoothly as possible, so you do everything in your power to prepare for it. It's a bit like a rock climber planning a very difficult rock climb. Internal short back uh, November 13th. What's the body position going to be? How am I going to get across that challenging obstacle? What's an alternative route if that route doesn't work out? Zero, zero, one, two. We had to go to the very, very furthest edge, carrying this component the size of a small fridge, and we could only change it during darkness because there was live electricity flowing down this panel. So we had only 40 minutes of darkness as the ISS orbits the Earth where we could safely get this job done. Yeah, let me get a little bit more. Forward. I think that will help. Being the first Britain to undertake a, a spacewalk, it didn't really weigh on me. You know, I was in the airlock and all I was thinking about was I've got to get all of this equipment out to Tim Cobra without any of it getting tangled. Okay, I'm coming out. Okay. okay let's watch the other uh, lines as you come out. Yeah. When we're leaving the airlock, we've got a couple of people talking to us. There's Scott Kelly inside the space station and that's what's called the IV crew member. And we're also okay. talking to mission control. Okay. I'll just watch that tether when I go back in. Okay. And they will run the entire spacewalk. So they local down and it might be able to. Okay. Tim was in constant communication with Mission Control back in Houston. Uh, they regularly talked to both astronauts, reassuring them, telling them uh, how they're performing against the clock, whether they're on schedule. On a spacewalk, it comes down to individuals to concentrate, to focus, and to not make mistakes. 
you're also operating in an environment where if something does happen, you have limited time to put it right. You know, our spacesuits could probably keep us alive for about 30 minutes if there's a small hole in the suit, for example. But if we rip our glove more than six millimeters, that's it, game over. Our suit just cannot maintain enough pressure to keep us alive. So you're constantly aware of where you're putting your hands, looking out for sharp fragments that are out there, not um, forgetting to tether yourself to the space station every time you stop and take your hands off a handrail. This is locked. It's about eighth of an inch from lock. And that's when Scott Kelly said, hey, you know, Tim, it's great to see that Union flag exploring space. It's explored all over the world. And, and it really kind of uh, sort of shot me out of my zone. And I thought, you know what? You're right. This is an incredibly proud moment. And I was quite glad he said that because I was able then to cherish it a bit more. Guys, we got good KU. We're watching Sunset right along with you. Three minutes until we get started here. Thanks, We've had lots of problems with bolts in the past that don't release properly, and so pieces of equipment, despite changing them out, haven't functioned. And I do see us uh, getting a little ratty on the comm. That should last for about the next five minutes. So all these things are going through your mind. You have got to have complete awareness of what you're doing. But at the same time, what's your crew member doing? Where are they? Have they checked in with you the last couple of minutes? You know, you're responsible for their life too. So it's an enormous amount of concentration and focus that you have to keep going for eight hours. Um, so when we, when we managed to change it out in the one night orbit and we got the word from Mission Control, literally about 10 minutes later, you know, guys, we've got, we got good power. With that solar panel's back online. It was a huge relief and it was really satisfying. Yeah, Tim, that's perfect framing right there. We like that. And now I can afford to just, you know, relax, enjoy the view, take some photos. To get out of the relative safety of the International Space Station and see the Earth below you, Mother Earth, that blue and white planets slowly rotating beneath you and there's nothing between it and you. You are all to intents and purposes just falling towards it, knowing that if a meteorite hit you, you would die. If you somehow managed to snap the tether that ties you to the, the space station, you would float out into the vacuum of space. The amount of water just strikes you on planet Earth when you see it from space, reflecting all this wonderful sunlight. And then, of course, you're aware of how fast you're traveling around. You're seeing whole continents pass beneath you, amazing colors. The Sahara Desert is just this wonderful orange glow. You pass over South America and you get the, the lush green of the Amazon. You're seeing these features of Earth as you, you've kind of seen them on an atlas, but you're seeing them with your own eyes at 400 kilometers down beneath you. And then when night comes, everything just comes into this tiny bubble of what's in front of you with your two headlights. Your entire world shrinks to just a small pool of light. So at nighttime, if you look up, you'll see a bright strip of the Milky Way, which is absolutely beautiful. And then when the lights of towns and cities come out, you get to look down at that as well and see all these signs of human habitation. When you're on the spacewalk, just things are constantly changing and it's, uh, you know, sunrises, sunsets uh, are magical to see as well. As we uh, continue to watch uh, Tim Peake being assisted out of his extravehicular mobility unit. You know, living on Earth, surrounded by nature, uh, clouds, by our atmosphere, by our environment, it's very easy to, to forget that if you just go a few kilometers above you, there is a complete vacuum, which will kill you in, in less than 60 seconds. And, and when we are out in space and we look at that atmosphere, we see how thin it is. It really brings home just how vulnerable we are as a species, as life on Earth is, is vulnerable. You know, uh, it's reliant on that atmosphere to keep going. So I think your perspective certainly does change when you see Earth from space. It's an awe-inspiring view. Standing by for physical separation. After careful checks for air leaks, Mission Control gave the order to release the hooks, clamping the Soyuz to the space station. Undocking confirmed. 
And the six months on the ISS were just remarkable to be part of a dynamic team, to be contributing to something that uh, you know, has such benefit to, to humanity. So it's an enormous privilege to be there. Only when at a safe distance did they ignite the engines, the moon providing a stunning celestial backdrop. It's something that I hope that we will you know, keep going as in terms of our research station in low Earth orbit and we'll continue that partnership that will take us to the moon and subsequently onto Mars. Down to Earth with a bump. Tim Peake was back from a 78 million mile space odyssey. Best ride I've been on ever. Truly elated, I mean, just the smells of, uh, of Earth are so strong. As of 2021, NASA remains committed to returning astronauts to the moon by the end of the decade, in addition to advancing a human mission to Mars. Tim Peake, Britain's first spacewalk, was recorded by Tom Gillespie, production and sound design by Rob Mulhern. For more on this episode, go to skynews.com forward slash storycast21. Next time, a television recording team find themselves under siege in one of the world's most luxurious hotels. And no one was coming to get us. It was really quite bizarre. All the Indians was calling friends. And I said, look, guys, you've got to just text. We don't want them to know we're here and how many are here and what's going on. So please just go to text. So everyone just went silent. But we could hear people being um, killed, playing for their lives, and then you know being shot, and the bodies were being thrown over the stairwell, and they were piling up down below. We, we got all that from all the iPhones and stuff like that. <laughs>